Hey folks, welcome to MLR Kickoff and boy oh boy, what a week it's been. It, it will be a quiet show I'm sure today as uh, we're joined by special guest James Patterson. The professor is in the dentist chair instead of the professor's lab as he is getting some cavities drilled. The only time he's been silent in his life is when he's full of Novocaine and a dentist drill. So, But JP, what a quiet week. What are we going to talk about today? Nothing going on in the league. Absolutely nothing going on. I don't think there's anything we can talk about. It's, yeah, well, let, let's get the formalities out of the way. How are you doing? How's uh, is the summer treating you and the family? Everyone good? Yeah, great, mate. Can't complain. Enjoying summer. It's about time to start laying on that tan. It's that time of year, mate. Yeah, well, why are you looking at me when you say that? I look a little... <laughs> I'll work. I'll work on it. I'll work on it. Well, let's uh, let's not muck around too much. Obviously, uh, a huge week, right? Uh, Austin, the news comes out first. Um, violating league policies, removed from the playoffs, and then as we are recording, Los Angeles uh, follows suit. So, San Diego have gone from Mad Monday to a mad rush to book flights. Uh, they'll be heading up to Starfire to play Seattle now. Here's the crazy thing with this, James. That actually plays into San Diego's favour. You don't have time to kind of stress through the game, no pressure. It's like, hey, we've got a lifeline, a second chance here. They're a great roster. Here's the big question. Is Paddy Ryan on a plane from Sydney to Seattle right now? Because the Waratahs are out of Super Rugby. He's contracted to the Legion. Wouldn't that be interesting? That would be huge, wouldn't it? I, I didn't think about that. I do agree with you, though. On the one hand... I mean, it's one of those things. When you've got no pressure, that's when you perform the best. And this really is no pressure if you look at San Diego. I mean, they, they probably have a few hangovers to get over first before they head back to the training pitch, as, as you do at the end of the season. But honestly, I mean, what more of a narrative do you want? Here's our opportunity. We get a chance to come in, and really, they can go the distance. I think they've got what it takes. They put together some great performances heading down the final stretch. So I think I actually think it's going to be a cracker of a game. Me too. And I, I, I tend to wonder here in this situation, did Seattle play their grand final on the weekend against LA? You know, they got the second chance. And they're like, oh, my God, hang on, we're, we're alive here. We win this game. We're in the playoffs. And now it's like, well, yeah, you're in the playoffs. And guess who else is in the playoffs? San Diego right behind you now. So what a, what a, what a fun time to be alive. Isn't it? I mean, yeah. it, I, I just... It's kind of unprecedented, but it's also exciting. And for the fans as well, you know, it's it's interesting to see. It'll be good to see what the crowds are. Obviously, you know, these late-minute changes make it difficult to sell tickets. But for fans that th thought they were out of it, they have the opportunity to rally and get into it. I think we're going to see a good turnout. Yeah, Houston went from, hey, we're going to be on the road the entire playoffs to like, hey, we're hosting a Western Conference championship <laughs> in two weeks. Uh, good stuff. Couldn't happen to a better club, though. Jake T on yet. Uh, he's still a little salty that I mentioned about his uh, follically challenged. So, you know, beautiful head of hair, great human, great family man, great guy. There's three compliments for you, JT. Now you need to back right off. All right, what was your uh, game of the week on the weekend? Which one caught your eye? <sighs> I mean, I don't know. I, to be honest, I thought it was the Seattle game. I, mean, I agree. It was a great game. It, it, was, it, it was like finals footy watching that. And, you know, Seattle, we've talked about it all season, how dangerous they can be on the attack. And, you know, they, they showed it. I thought, Yosefa, I thought a number of the players really stood up. And it was a good game. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a big Yosefa fan. I watched him play for the USA in 15s, probably like five, maybe six years ago. It was a while ago. And I'm like... 15s is your game, pal. And he obviously proved me wrong and went and had a phenomenal sevens career. But when I saw his name pop back up um, with Seattle this season, I was super excited. And he's been in and out of the team most of the year, I think, uh, through, through injury more so than form. But uh, he, he's just a talented individual, like super talented individual. I'm, I'm glad he's playing well. And he could be a big part. Like him and Le if Lepetti's health, healthy this weekend, I mean, they're a massive chance of getting this game against San Diego and moving on. So. It wasn't that early in the season. There was that great image of, was it Lepetti? And it was Nonu. And Nonu. No. Yeah. Is that going to be the rematch? There's going to be a few hard hits there. I agree with you, Sefo. I mean, yeah. I can remember back, I think it was five or six years ago, 
And was it the the sevens in Glendale, the rugby town? Yeah. Seven, yeah, yeah. Playing. Do you remember? He was playing for that team. I remember. I thought he was up. playing for the Denver Selects team. Was Selects, that, was it? It might have been a different year. Yeah. But he was just on fire. And I was like, he needs to be playing 15s. This guy has has it all. He had the skill, the vision, and we've seen him obviously have a great career in sevens and then add a massive impact in 15s. Yeah. We'll be good. It'll be good. We'll get into our uh, previews and tips a little later. But let's uh, let's move on to our player interview here. It's, it's going to be a good one because uh, – this guy's been on the show a couple of times. What, what, give me your thoughts on Johan Momsen, James. What do you think of the big South African lock from Atlanta? I tell you what, I wouldn't want to run into him in drills. He looks like kind of if we go a blast from the past to a guy named Scott Lavala, who was Robocop and he played for the US and he was one that would take out teammates in friendly fire and drills all the time. I think... Momsen is the guy that you don't want to be taken out of, <laughs> especially at training. He's just, he, he's got that enforcer mentality. And he, it, obviously off the pitch versus on the pitch, they're completely different. He's just such a nice guy. But you just, you get this like opinion of him and the way he plays. He's an enforcer. I love the way he plays and he's a massive part of that team. Yeah, I remember you and I ran into him and uh, Mano uh, Renungas after the final last year, and they like you know they called him War Machine or something like that. Because it's a great nickname. But these two were like just so physical and dominant for Atlanta, and we're kind of like, oh, let's let's see how we go here. But both like the nicest guys ever you could ever ask to meet, and total gentleman to chat to. So, well, let's not stand around anymore. Let's bring him in, Johan Momsen from Rugby ATL. And welcome, Johan Momsen from Rugby ATL. Johan, welcome to MLR Kickoff. Hey, thank you. Thanks for having me. I, I have been told by um, Aaron Castro, that boy, that you've been on this show four times. I mean, I think it's because you were MLR Forward of the Year last year. You've been on multiple teams of the week. And so apparently everyone already knows your background. So we're not going to dive in there. Um, I've also been told that geopolitics isn't your strong suit, so we won't be talking about anything that happens there. But we will be talking about barbecue, um, Atlanta, heat and humidity at some point in this show. All right. Sounds good. But I want to I actually start. You know, here you guys, you guys are heading into, um, into the playoffs. You're ho- hosting Rugby New York um, and uh, hoping to play the Free Jacks in the finals of the Eastern Conference. Talk to me a little bit generally about um, what have you been most proud of um, for the team this year? Most proud of, um, I guess, just we've had uh, just just overcoming adversity, really. Um, uh, in the beginning of the season, obviously, Coach, Coach Scott Lawrence um, not uh, announcing that he's not going to be with us for the rest of the season, um, which is... That's a big change. Um, and then a few uh, guys on the squad that got cut, a few guys that got uh, traded to other teams. Um, for us being a real big family, playing rugby over here, it's, uh, it's sad to see some guys go, especially if it's mid-season. They train hard, worked hard with us in the beginning, and then um, they got to move on. Um, but, yeah, the boys really handled it well. And uh, we, are, we got to a point where we set our target for in the beginning of the year so yeah now um you know your head coach steve brett's are very different than scott lawrence both in terms of sort of his area of expertise in the game but also in terms of i think his personality can you talk a little bit about you know obviously there's a strong culture under scott lawrence you made the finals last year but it feels like you might be scoring a few more points this year it feels like there's a little bit more freedom um, at least from the outside. Is that true from the inside? Um, definitely, yeah. Rugby-wise, a little bit of a different uh, point of view. I think last year we had a very much a focus on defense, uh, which laid the foundation for us to be and get where we were. Um, and then this year, I guess, to be an all-rounded or a, a great team, you have to have both of them. Um, so we had the foundation for that. Um, and I think... Um, not necessarily say even shifted the focus, but definitely worked harder on our attack. Um, and uh, yeah, it's looking good. We can score a lot of points. We still managed to hold some teams to under two or one try a game. And uh, yeah, I think it's a good balance we have currently. 
Well, let's talk about one of the best performances of the season, and that was in New York against Rugby New York. You guys won 38-3. I think, I mean, I don't know if it probably wasn't the most shocking result, but it certainly was a shock. Talk a little bit about what went well in that game, because Rugby New York's obviously a very good team, but you really dominated them. Yeah, look, um, I think, unfortunately for them, uh, they had a... uh, a tough start to the game. Uh, red card early. I think uh, Severa got a, a concussion in that game. And uh, yeah, I think we were able to really disrupt the lineouts and their set piece in the game. Uh, they couldn't really uh, get started. So put a lot of pressure on them through that. And then in the rest of the game, pressure just kept building. And uh, yeah, flattering score at the end. Uh, it was a good game. Uh, always good to beat New York, so. You know, let's let's talk a little bit about your scrum. So I'm having a look. So um, you guys have the best scrum percentage in the league. league. You've won 95% of your scrums, which is, which is always good. Like scrum percentages are good, but a couple of percentage is here and there. The big thing for me is you've only conceded 12 scrum penalties, less than one scrum penalty a game, which is really remarkable. So if you look at Rugby New York, they're actually pretty good. They're at 20. The Houston Sabercats, like they're at 35. The Free Jacks, they're at 19. Talk to me a little bit about what you guys do during the week when it comes to scrummaging that makes you so strong. Um, really not nothing much special. I think it's just really... Um, it's, it's guys really doing homework on the opposition and then... Um, being able to train in that uh, atmosphere, I almost want to say. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's always a good competition. If you can train hard against your fellow teammates, it just makes you, I mean, I guess even more conf- confident to go take on other players. Um, if you can really uh, be physical against your teammates, um, the ones you care about, then what can you not do to other people you you don't care about? You know what I mean? Um, right. so, <laughs> yeah, I think I think that's uh, that's what's been working for us. Um, putting a lot of work in off the field and on the field. Um, so yeah, I'm not going to give all our secrets away, but but that's that's pretty much what it comes down to. Well, I'm not I'm not digging for secrets, but I am digging for insights because the other place that you guys really excel is in the lineout. You have the highest lineout in the league. Number two is actually Rugby New York. Right. So this we'll see two of the best lineouts. You talk about Nick Savannah and how important he is. Talk to us a little bit about how you and your team, not necessarily New York, don't want don't want you to tell us about them, but tell us a little bit about how you prep. Like how much of it is based on what you do and your game, and how much is it really scouting the opposition? And maybe how does that change throughout the season? Um, look, you don't want to drown yourself looking at videos and overcomplicate things um you really look at the pictures they show and make plans around that every week um and then it's it's about repetition um really so yeah we're just strict with our strict with what we do uh everyone has to buy into it everyone uh and everyone does buy into it and uh, uh line very i don't know if you really you uh, you look like you you might have been a second row loose forward in the day, but uh, it's, uh, <laughs> um, I'm no. a scrum half, so like I wanted my lineouts to work, my scrums to work well because it made me look good, right? <laughs> so bad lineouts and bad scrums, I didn't like. So I was invested, and I have I've, I have coached the set piece a little bit. So tell me, yeah, yeah, come on, share with me a little bit of because repetition, footwork, quickness, all of those things are important. Right. All those things are really important. It's all about timing. It's all about footwork and lifting, and uh, everything has to be hundred um, percent. I mean, if if a if a lift is slow, the ball's going to go over. If uh, the timing of the throw is out, the ball's going to go over. Or it's it's yeah. Um, but it's it's a really satisfying thing, perfecting a lineup, and that's what we strive for, I guess. Um, perfection. So standards are really high, and the boys love chasing that. So it's, yeah, and, and it's one of those things like the, the ball gets thrown over the jumper and everyone looks at the hooker and the hooker's like looking at the lifter and being like, you missed your lift and you're making me look bad, right? Yeah. So yeah. it all comes down to the hooker, even though it was like that back jumper was, that was a step too slow. 
right yeah, no, so, so you've got to look at all the other things if the the ball goes over it's all the other things first if everything else was right and the ball went over and then it's the hookers then was maybe the hookers fault but yeah so this is your third season in major league rugby talk a little bit about some of the players you've come across this year that have been like your biggest challenge like the players that have really stood out for you that you've played against it's tough. It's been a long season. Um, Just talk about the last two or three weeks then. There you go. That's fine. <laughs> I have to um, say Stan South from DC, uh, especially in lineup time and on the field. He's definitely someone uh, someone to, to reckon with. Um, and then, um, I mean, Isaac Ross, legend, um, and, and, and lineups especially, he's always hard to go against. He didn't play the game we played against in uh, I mean, Austin came and played here, but even last year he was a he was quite a force to reckon with in the lineouts. Um, I mean, yeah, I guess I uh, compare myself to other locks, so uh, or not really even, but that's the guys I try to try to beat at the end of the day. Um, so that's yeah, that's a few names, I guess. Now, um, you know, you've talked about the physicality the rugby ATL have at practice. I would bet not many people want to tackle you at ATL, but who's the guy on the team that when you're doing like your warm up, like tackling, you're like, oh no, I do not want to be matched up with that guy. Who's the guy that like everyone doesn't want, like never has a partner in the warm up tackles because everyone's trying to grab someone else? Um, I would say probably it's either. I would say um, John Roy Jenkinson, or it'll be maybe Will Burke Lucid, um, for different reasons. Um, Will Burke just he, he doesn't know anything but one hundred and ten percent. So there's no there's never a little gentleman's agreement. Um, but with John Roy, he's just a big fella, so it's a lot of mess around it. Uh, you don't really want to have that body running out at you at warm-up. Uh, if you want to tackle him, I'd save it for game time. So, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's great. That's great. Yeah, there's always one guy who doesn't know how to do 50%, right? It just doesn't, like, like just doesn't know. Like, the coach is showing 50% or whatever it is. And there's always one guy who just is always... I like, And you love him when he's on your team. But hmm. in practice, you just, like, just sit this one out, dude. Just... Yeah. <laughs> just, just just don't do it. You know, one of the things I've really noticed in your game, and maybe it's a little bit more than this year than last year, but we found you in the open field a little bit more. Like, like, like you found yourself making some breaks. I'm not sure if that is like, like this little bit more of an open game plan that you have, a little bit more decision making. Um, any conversations with the coach about maybe playing in the back row a little more? Um, more in the open field a little more? I mean, I would, I wouldn't mind. Um, I think I said it on the previous show, though. I still prefer playing in the thick of the things. Uh, I find myself just you stay in the game better. It's maybe just me, but uh, hanging around on the edges, it's, it, it's a little boring. Um, but uh, yeah, I think definitely uh, the the game we're playing. I think it's a little faster. We we're creating more space, opens up more space. Uh, so. I think that might be the reason for it, um, but nothing specifically different that I think I'm doing. You know, and, and one of the things that, you know, so I, I was, when I was young, I was a hooker, right? But I've actually coached the scrum a little bit. And there is apparently something, you know, about being a dominant scrum and being in that tight five and just like walking over the opposition, right? There, there, there's something that people say, there's nothing else that really compares to doing that. And you guys have done that like quite a bit this year right yeah it's uh, i mean it's the same thing as having a mall and the op opposition knows exactly exactly where the ball's going and it's just uh, a strength measuring contest uh and you still score uh there's there's not a, a lot of things that i mean gets you going and gets the whole team going like, like that so uh, yeah it's definitely something that 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 helps us this season well before i let you go um um, I want to ask, like, this is your third year in Atlanta? Yeah. Um, like, uh, what's your favorite place to eat? My favorite place to eat? Uh, it's, a, it's a local Greek restaurant just up the road. Uh, Zeus, Zeus Greek street food. Uh, love the Euros. Um, 
yeah, then and there's just a Smoothie King right next to it where I make a stop pretty Oh, often. there you go. So, <laughs> so I was going to say, I was going to say, I'm, I'm like, not, I'm not sure that, that, a, that, a, that a hero for you is going to be enough. You need, you need a smoothie. Now, is that a place that all the guys go to or is that your place? Um, I think Zeus is, that's, that's kind of mine, uh, or not mine, definitely not mine, but, uh, it's, that's, that's right. my thing. But the Smoothie King is definitely a local stop, uh, on our way back from training. Usually you get the Hulk, uh, about seven, a thousand seven hundred calories, uh, after a good day of training <laughs> and, and gulp that down. So I, I, yeah, I think, I think 1700 calories might be my daily caloric <laughs> intake that I'm supposed to have. So I don't think I should have it. It's called the Hulk. Yeah. Got it. I got it. Okay. And then what's your favorite? So, so two more questions. Are, are you a coffee drinker? Do you like to sit at coffee shops? So what's your favorite coffee shop? Don't say uh, Starbucks. We'll have to edit that out if you say Starbucks. No, no, no. Uh, we do stop at Dunkin' Donuts a lot, but uh, my favorite one is actually um, right here in the complex that I live. It's uh, Walton on the Chattahoochee. They have their own coffee company right there um down by the river so it's a nice outing to just walk down there grab a coffee sit by the river enjoy the outside um, oh wow that's very nice right there right there yeah, that's, that's that's crazy well, definitely one of the favorite uh, places for me uh, in atlanta currently it's right here though so <laughs> that's that's awesome okay last question about atlanta how do you explain to your friends back home how hot it gets and when you play rugby in june in atlanta it's hard to explain especially for two south africans uh we don't really uh, i mean durban gets a little bit humid but it's nothing compared to this um i think there's one example that i always tell my friends it was in my first year i got here i think our air control in, in the house the ac was on like 72 fahrenheit and um i woke up it was eight in the morning walked to my window and it was uh it was just, what do you call it? Uh, condensation. Condensation. I thought it, right. I thought it, it was from the inside because it was cold outside and hot inside. Or and right. it wasn't. It was from the outside. It was like someone was blowing into the window. Um, and that's that's what I try to explain to people. That's crazy. Um, and being soaking wet all the time. Uh, <laughs> yeah, definitely something. Well, I think. Yeah, I mean, I I think. I mean, I think it might have been um, your game against the Arrows where the ball was in play for like a ridiculously long time. Like the kickers weren't making touch. And I could just see all the forwards in the middle. Like, it, I don't think you were talking to each other, but you probably could have because it was like there was just in that heat and humidity, it just like, like at some point your, your body, you just say, look, I'm just going to, I need a break. I need to get some water. It, it Now, it's it should be an advantage for you against New York, right? Yeah, I mean uh, the game we played up in New York was pretty hot too, so I guess it does get hot there. Um, probably but not, not as consistently. Good. Yeah, not as consistently as here, but uh, yeah, it would definitely. Uh, we're playing at, at night, so the heat probably won't be too much of a factor. But oh, the humidity, right. yeah. humidity will definitely. Uh, either slow the game down or just make it more of a physical affair. Uh, so either way exciting to watch um looking forward to that yeah well yeah and thank you so much for taking the time today to be on mlr kickoff excited to watch your game should be a great matchup with um rugby new york and we wish you luck thank you very much there you go. Big game this weekend coming up at uh, at home, and I'm, I'm getting I'm getting I'm getting word in my ear that they'll be actually playing at Kennesaw State, which is that gorgeous field down there. Uh, it's on the outside of Atlanta, back closer to Life University, but just a beautiful pitch, grass, great seats. I think it's probably like seven to nine thousand capacity around that mark, and they should fill that out. Atlanta, they've had a good year with crowds down there, so excited to watch this game on the weekend, JP. Yeah, it'll be awesome. I think that's a great venue to have a game at. And, you know, if we look at we look at the way they've been trending and ever since last season, I mean, they've looked dominant all year long. So I think that we talked about early on the effect of the changes in the coaching staff and obviously the ownership, but I've been really impressed with the way that coaching staff has gone through the season, managed their players. And I think Steve Brett needs a big pat on the back for what he's done with this team. 
Well, well that can transition us into our rugby 101. And let, let's talk about coaching changes because we've seen quite a few this year. Coaching changes. When you played, did you ever go through a, a coaching transition mid-season? Never mid-season. I think that would be really, really difficult to do. Well, that really that ends one hundred and one. Thanks, James. Thanks for giving me an example there. <laughs> what about you? Did you go through a coaching change mid-season? I mean, I think it's it's one of those things that yeah, if there was a planned coaching change, it would come after the season. And I think there's two trains of thoughts to that. Do you make the change early and then get uh, the opportunity for someone to come in and, and and kind of have an influence on the on the team and the culture? Uh, because that's in some instances, I think that's probably better off. I've been part of teams where it was clear that the coach wasn't going to get re-signed the following year, yeah. and the culture and, and things really went downhill. So there was nothing really to gain out of that shift from mid-season towards the end of the season, as opposed to if you make that change, you've got the chance to be able to change the culture and 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 start to put some of those systems that you want to see in place. And it gives an opportunity for an interim coach to really put his hand up. Yeah, I think you've nailed it there. I think there's two considerations if you're going to make a change. Is, is locker room, like, are you going to keep the locker room? Like, are the players going to stay? You know, is the culture of that locker room important? If you've got a bulk squad that you're going to bring back the next year despite a coaching change, then you make the change, right? If, if, if you lose players out of that core group, you could be in trouble. And the other is the fan base. The fan base turn away from the team if you don't make a change, then obviously that's less dollars coming in, makes that – a more difficult franchise to run. So those would be the big considerations. Um, I, I have, similar to you, being in a team where it was known the coach wasn't coming back and it was uh, it, it was weird. It was really weird uh, for the last like three or four games. Probably my fault the guy got canned, but um, that's a totally different show. We can dive into that. All right, let's go into the games this weekend, just two, so we can take a, a pretty decent dive into these. Uh, starts on Saturday, uh, New York, at Atlanta, 8.30 Saturday night, your old teammate Steve Brett has – he's had a good year down there. Like, let's be honest, I think a lot of people thought Atlanta were going to have a tough year with just a brutal offseason. Um, owner, uh, Marcus Callaway, unfortunately passes in the offseason. Scott Lawrence leaves. Uh, two huge figures in that franchise gone. You wouldn't blame them if, if they had a disastrous year, but they're, in fact, galvanized around Steve Brett and had a phenomenal year, reinvented themselves. They come up against Atlanta. Uh, they are Atlanta. They come up against New York, apologies, who are probably, considering the news today, the biggest star power team left in the league. Uh, three All Blacks in that squad. The three All Blacks or four All Blacks? How many do they have now? Three. Who am I forgetting? Great. Naholo, Nene, Ellis. Andy Ellis. Yeah. Is that, is that it? I think so. Is there anyone in the forward pack? No. Aren't you all all black trialists essentially though? So technically <laughs> say that. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Thoughts. Thoughts here. You know, this will be an interesting game. I think uh, if you look look at some of the narratives there, so you've got the playoff and you've got in the front row, you've obviously got Chance Wengluski who switched sides and he was a big loss. If you look at the losses in the front row for Atlanta last year and the way their scrum's actually been able to perform this year, they've done well in blooding in new talent. I think that's a big testament to the full coaching that they have um, because if you take away, who was a massive rig last year? Was it Sa'alu, the prop? He was the guy that they could bring on to stabilize the scrum. And then obviously you had uh, Chance, who's a, who's a great player, uh, obviously eagle level player. And so the scrum was a big facet of dominance. Now you flip this over to the other side. And I really feel like the New York scrum's been really strong this year. And, and for me, it comes down to a couple key battles. I think the loose forward battle is key. And then I actually mm -hmm. think we're going to say all we want about the outside backs and the star power and everything. But I actually think it comes down to the midfield. I think guys like the, the battle in the midfield, you've got guys like Emery, and then you've got obviously on the other side, Len Leonard. I think the midfield and the loose forward trio would be two of the bigger deciding factors in this game. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned Chance goes to Atlanta, uh, Atlanta to New York, Leonard, New York to Atlanta. So there is some familiarity between the two, but vastly different. I, I've always felt like in big games, uh, you know, obviously defense becomes so important in. in finals footy um, but also having a player with the ability to do something out of nothing 
in those tight games can be the difference as well. Where I feel like New York has those players where Atlanta doesn't. So Atlanta need to drag this into an arm wrestle. Um, physical, slow. And the problem is it's on a super fast track. Kennesaw is, is a soccer field. It's wide and it's fast. Soccer fields are much bigger than, you know, the American football fields like we saw at um, like Hoboken where, where New York plays quite narrow. So it's going to be expansive and wide, which plays into the footwork of a guy like Nini Um, You know, Andy Ellis is going to enjoy playing on a really fast, nice grass track as well. So I don't know, man. Big experience in those in that New York side there. I, I, I tend to lean towards the experience in that situation as well. So a couple of World Cups. What is it? They all won World Cups. Andy won one. Yeah. And the other boys won 2015. Yeah. So, whew. I- I mean, I think that, but it goes down to this. They, we know the style of rugby Atlanta's going to play. I mean, they pretty much played the same game plan right through the season. So they they use the kicking game very well. They apply a lot of pressure. They put a lot of pressure on in defence. They try and force penalties and turnovers. They'll capitalise. Obviously, they'll take the points if they're available, and they'll drive you down into the corner. I think their equaliser is. I think New York's line out with all that experience is good, and their ability to be able to defend them all. I think if they can defend that wall early on, and they can kind of put a stop to that big facet of ATL's attack, I think that'll play into their hands because New York will want to draw them out into the kind of this shotgun sling fest where they throw the ball around, and Atlanta will want to control it, like you said control time of possession, control territory, and then make them attack from places where they're going to make mistakes. So, you know, it could, it could come down to how this game starts. You know, if they're able to defend a couple of these, these trademark malls from ATL, if they're able to play more in ATL's territory, I think ATL could be playing from behind. And that's not a good situation for them playing from behind. We've seen that yeah. this year. They, they didn't do well against the Guillotinis playing from behind. If a team will get out to a good start early, it's really difficult. But if ATL gets, you know, controls territory and possession early on, I think they really have a good shot of winning. What's your call? Who wins this game? <sighs> yeah, I'm going to go against it. I'm going to say ATL wins. Ooh. Hear that, Andy? Cancel that Wagyu beef package you're sending out <laughs> to Kansas City or reroute it to, to this guy. I'm saying New York. So we'll go, we'll split it there. I think New York can get it done. Just too many big game players. The bright lights, uh, they're used to it. All right, the second game is Austin-Houston. Check that. No, it's not. It's Seattle-Houston. No, check that. It's not that either. It's now Seattle-San Diego. We got it. We nailed it from, from just Monday to today. All right, a big one, right? Like, obviously, this is where all the changes come, and this is where the big news coming out of the Western Conference with LA and Austin. We now have San Diego back in on the road to Starfire, against Seattle. Seattle went from seven days ago, not even making the playoffs, can't do it, out to hang on, we're a chance, holy smokes, we're in, to now we're hosting uh, the eliminated game against San Diego. What a week. Yeah. And San Diego went from the other side of it, from tuning off, booking their off-season trips. There's probably a few boys off to Mexico and Ibiza and whatever. And then all of a sudden, all of a sudden, you know, they're probably, they probably hadn't slept for 24 or 48 hours post the last game. Then they find out they're in the playoffs and with a good matchup. So I, I think it comes down to going to Seattle again. So I think if it was in San Diego, it would be, I think, different. We know Starfire is a difficult place to play at. And we know Starfire is a really difficult place to play at, especially if the, the fans get behind them with yeah. a play chance. It's a tough place. It's a hostile environment. I expect a sellout crowd there. And it's not the most expansive field to play at. It feels narrow when you play there. It's not really, but it just, it, you watch the games there, they tend to get into more of a, this kind of the battle and that turf field. If the weather's good, I think we could be in for a shootout, but it's a tough place to play. It, it is, and it's one of the best places to call a game in Major League Rugby because when you, you, you know, we used to be on site, uh, you would sit above everyone and it's this old metal stand and they would just get loud and it would be bouncing off the roof. If there was ever like a, a competition, like the, the uh, opposition, sorry, line out, they would just be going mental, like mental. You couldn't hear yourself. And it's like, you know, like in the NFL, like how they get them 
third and anything for, for an opposition at their field. Arrowhead, you know, loudest stadium in sports. Sorry about that, Seattle, but you can't have everything. Um, you know, I went to a Chiefs-Packers game last year. It was it was just like I couldn't hear myself think. My like, yeah, whole body's vibrating. Can you imagine being in the middle of that? It's and it's got to play into the psyche. But they've yep. got some big names. Nonu, Rob Shaw, as long as, boy, can you imagine if those guys are already on a plane? You know, uh, Ryan Patterson and the team are there are going to be talking to the FAA. You need to reroute that plane, get it back. We need it back now. Um, but, yeah, it would be interesting to see the roster. But they had last weekend off too, so they, they're they fresh. Seattle have come yeah. out of an absolute war against LA. Dude, this, this, is, this is going to be really interesting. I've... I love the Cinderella story for San Diego. Like, no chance. All of a sudden, we're in and you win this game. You're, you're playing Houston to go to the final. And it's like... And I think yeah, the road the road map's there for, for them to do it. I think, you know, where they win this game is, in my mind, like we talked about earlier, if they really, there's no pressure on them and they're able to execute just a wider game plan. So like, I think if San Diego really play loose and play with flair and they're able to execute a lot of second touches and offloads and get in behind Seattle, get that, that Seattle defense kind of on the back foot a bit. I think, you know, that's where Seattle could really make a statement in this game. Sorry. I mean, San Diego could make a statement in this game. Um, Don't Seattle, worry. We're all confused as you, James. Don't <laughs> on, the, on the other hand, I think that, you know, it is an advantage coming off a high. That big victory, knowing last weekend that they, you know, knocked off LA. That gives you a lot of confidence heading into a match. And so you've got both sides of the equation there. Do you think it do you think it, when you were playing as a player, did you play better after a week off or did you play better after topping the top side? Oh you asking me to go way too far back here on a very specific moment. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't think there's a right answer because we've seen both work with, and it's always like hindsight's twenty twenty. If you, you get the week off or you rest players and then you lose, they're like, oh, you're underdone. You should have let them play. And other times you, you, you go hard and all of a sudden you lose a player and they're like, why weren't you resting them? You know, that was a pointless game. And now they're hurt and we lost. And it's like, you can't win, can't lose. You know, what do you do? So I, I don't know. I, I think just like you said, I think this is more about like the lack of build up and pressure on San Diego would be my message. You know, Danny Lee will be like just stressing like, hey, no one thought we would have this opportunity. So what we do with it, there is no, there's no loss here for us. You know, we just go out and let it, let it fly. So unless they actually lose, then obviously that would be a loss. But you know yeah. what I'm saying. And I mean, the last game wasn't a great one for Seattle either. So uh, it wasn't like they were carrying any form. It was a tough matchup against the Gilgronies. So uh, this one is, is, we might as well just like toss coins at this one at this stage. I think it's, it's, it's such a unique situation, but it, it, it really gives the opportunity to make this probably one of the more entertaining. I think it'll be a better game to watch, to be honest, than the New York game. Game. I think the New York yeah. ATL game will be like a traditional, you know, semi final. It'll be really tight and, and it, I don't think it'll be decided by much, but I think this other game will be a real shootout. Not to make light of the situation, but if you can't laugh, you'll definitely cry. It is only Tuesday when we're recording. Who knows who's actually going to play this weekend anyway? Yeah. So <laughs> it's, it's, been, it's been that kind of a week. So let's just. <laughs> Wait until the ball's kicked uh, on Saturday and Sunday before we see what happens. But all right, JP, thanks for jumping on, mate. Short notice. Yeah, no worries. Anytime. Anytime. Enjoy the games. Where are you going to watch the games this weekend? I think I'll probably, maybe from the golf course on my phone. It's supposed to be a nice weekend. Oh. So. Who's got it better than you? No, 8.30 p.m. at night. I won't be watching on the golf course. But, yeah, nah. I'll, I'll, You're pretty, that's 8.30 Eastern, so 7.30 here. It's still light. Maybe catch it in the clubhouse. No, I'll definitely, definitely be watching these games. I can't wait. I love finals footy. Uh, both on Fox Sports 2? Thumbs up, thumb down? Yes. Oh, he, he promised he wasn't going to talk today. He's had, he's had a rough one, but stats boy, we love him. Uh, both on FS2. Sorry, there was no listing on there. So, hey, get out, get to the clubhouse, JP. Ask him, say, can you put this on FS2, please? Uh, I want to watch and um, tell a friend over, a, what are you, a lemon drop martini guy? 
uh, espresso martini at that time of night. I've got to get get to get it up. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Not get get it up. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay. <laughs> That's a different podcast. We'll 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 touch on that one. We have uh, that over on a different show, but not right now. Um, all right, that wraps it up, man. It's great to see your face. I miss you. Good to see you too, mate. Miss you too. It's been 12 hours since I saw you last, so. Just <laughs> All right, that wraps it up. For James Patterson, Aaron Castro, Ryan Gindy, our entire team, this has been the MLR kickoff. Enjoy the finals, footy, and we'll catch you next week.